Hi, my name's Londe Yusuf. And my name is Reggie Williams. And we're the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In the next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we interview Hannah Beekler, a production designer. Hannah has worked on Fruitville Station, Creed, and Moonlight. In 2019, she won an Academy Award for her work on Black Panther. We talk with Hannah about pitching her vision to Marvel Studios, developing a portfolio, working with directors, and much more. And now, on to our interview. All right, thank you so much, Hannah, for joining us on the Black Film Space podcast. How are you today? Fine. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. We are really excited to have you on the podcast. There's so much to discuss here. We're just going to jump right in. What do you think makes a good production designer? I think a good production designer is someone who can create in unison with the other departments a uh, canvas for which to tell the story that is seamless. Mm. What kind of skills do you think a good production designer? I mean, I think that you have to have a vision. I think that you have to have, you know, honestly, life experience to be able to put yourself in many different types of situations. You have to be a researcher. You have to become an expert at what you're talking about, the story you're talking about, the people that you're talking about. And, you know, you do have to have some design skill as well. It's, you know, you have to be able to understand how things go together, how things work, how to engineer things, and also willing and able to break those rules when necessary. So can you talk a little bit about the differences in designing for like a small budget project versus a larger project? And that's, this, it's some, that's something I get asked about a lot because I haven't done something like Moonlight and Fruitvale Station, which were um, it's very small budgeted. Fruitvale was $600,000 and Moonlight was about $1.5 And then of course Black Panther, which was a giant movie. <laughs> this was a big movie. And honestly, my answer has always been the same that other than the amount of zeros and the many people, my job is still the same. It still entails management of people, being able to tell a story through design, understanding how design works, managing budgets, uh, working with producers and director and costume designer. Like I do all those things as well. I think, you know, when you're talking about something like Black Panther, you have many, many more people and a lot more time to do the things that you have to do. And I think while you have to be as much of a visionary on something like Fruitvale as you do on something like Black Panther. Being a visionary isn't limited to, you know, sci-fi and futuristic or superhero or, you know, fantasy or fairy tale. It's also um, necessary in telling dramatic stories that are set in real life as well. Got you, got you. So what, can you walk us through your pre-production process? how you're brought onto a film, how you're preparing for the production. Yeah. So I usually come on, you know, director will reach out and, you know, get a script. That's the first thing if they're interested in me as a production designer. And after that, I, you know, I break the script down. I read the script first just to read it. You know, for me, it's always like, do I connect with the script? Do I see something in it that is interesting to me or that I want to pursue or a thought or something, a theme? And if that's the case, I'll go back and read it again and break it down and I create a deck, which is usually a series of referential images that I use to sort of convey to the director and producers if they look at it as well like sort of how i see the script visually um and that can be very metaphorically and it can be very literally depending on you know what i'm kind of the, the things i'm pulling out of the script to show so i'll do a deck that's you know not something very big two three hundred pages and send that on to the director 
and then we'll set up a meeting and that's really where I start. So production design, you know, I come on right after the director and the locations person usually comes on right after I do. Once I go through that process, you know, and have the conversations with the director about his, his or her vision as to what they see and where our, our kind of ideas and thoughts intersect. And then I go to the drawing table and I'll start kind of digging into the story and researching if there's, you know, if that's necessary, if I'm telling a true story or if I want to tell a story where I'm involving, you know, other cultures or ideas or science or something that I need to research. I'll do a lot of that. Sometimes I bring researchers on to help depending on how big it is. I had two researchers on Black Panther. And then after that, I'll start creating, you know, what's practically in the set. So if I need to build, I'll start designing, you know, what it is I need to build. And then I'll work with art directors and construction coordinators, set designers, model makers, graphic designers, and the set decorator to complete a look of, you know, the, the sets or a set, depending on, you know, what we're doing and where we're at deciding with locations, whether it's going to be a practical location that we augment, or are we building on a stage or a back lot someplace? And how does that then affect the budget? The one thing that you always have to remember is keeping your eye on the numbers and making sure you're staying within the budget. And if you need more money, being able to have those conversations or figuring out how to make something work either by you know, maybe taking away a couple elements or, you know, changing size or rethinking design because that's also a part of it. So that's really kind of the stages that you go through up until the set gets built and the actors come on and they're shooting your set. And once the on-set crew comes on, it's kind of no longer my baby anymore. It's up to them to kind of do with it what they will as far as how, you know, they want to shoot the set. But that's kind of nuts and bolts of the process. So what are you doing when you're on set? When I, when they're shooting? Yeah. I'm the type of person or the designer who likes to come to the, open the set whenever there's a new set or whenever it's the first day of shooting it. And pretty much if they're shooting a set for two weeks, I'll go every morning. I'll get my breakfast, <laughs> I'll get food. And you kind of walk through the first day with the director and the producers and you know, they're kind of, the director's sort of looking at the set to see where he wants the shots to be or they want their shots to be. And I'm kind of just making sure that it's ready and for shooting and, and needing to be what it is for the moment the camera goes up. I don't ever stick around because I've got probably, Lord knows how many other sets I have to get to, meetings I still have to have. You know, I have to be at the mill, which is the construction mill and the set deck warehouse. I have to have meetings with the prop master and the costume designer. So, you know, and especially if we're building, growing things, which by that, I mean, if we're having things 3D printed, I have to see what that's got. So there's so much for me to do. I can't be on set all day long, but I do go every morning, mm -hmm. you know, uh, talk to the director. Sometimes I'll come back at lunchtime when the director has a few minutes so we can have a quick meeting about like, we're working on this set or if there's a scheduling issue. But I'm really not an on-set person. <laughs> Got you. Is that typical for production designers or is that your choice? I think it's pretty typical. I think that it might be a little atypical for someone who's there all day long. And I think it's preferential too to how the designers feel about how they work with their processes. Some designers like to be there with the director, I guess. You know, I don't really know. The one thing about designers is we don't ever get to work together because there's only one position on a film. So I, I don't often get to see designers processes other than outside of talking to them about it. But it is certainly the way I work because that's how I worked when I was a set decorator. So it's always sort of been the way I've done things. And I think probably a lot more designers do that as well because you do have, I mean, there's times when you have a hundred sets and even if you have four or five months to shoot, you're still building sets while you're shooting. So you have to get to the next thing to make sure that everything is going correctly with that is going right with that because they're probably coming into that set in a week. Got you. So who is in charge of making sure that the design is being executed the way you envisioned it? You know, at the end of the day, you know, the buck stops at me. 
and a set goes up and it's what's approved, then it's what I've asked for from the team. And, you know, we've got construction coordinators and construction foremen who are over all of the construction. We have set designers who are making the plans, what you would blueprints and drafting and art directors who are then working with all of these teams to make sure that in working with me that the sets are what we've been discussing with not only the studio, but with the director and with myself. You know, when I go to on set to see how some application has turned out or something is coming along, I have to visit several times because, you know, the scenic charge who is the lead painter or the lead plaster. They want my feedback and I want to give them my feedback because I want to make sure that it's right at the end of the day for the director. And, and everybody that, that works with me are artists and designers. So they may have something to say to me that I hadn't even thought of that makes that piece or that set a thousand times better. So, you know, it's also because when people work with me, they bring their abilities to the table and I'm respectful of that. We are all creatives. Can you talk a little bit about how you ensure that all these moving parts translate well to the director? Like, how do you present it to them so they're not like overwhelmed or confused? You know, I guess, and it depends on the director and how they like to receive information. You got to kind of figure that out really quickly um, when you meet someone. Mm -hmm. And it's just through a lot of observation and listening to them and how they talk about you know, how they're talking about the script to you. Are they showing you a lot of images? Are they right. describing that to you in a very, you know, l lyrical way? Like they're telling a story as you're reading a book. Are they concentrating on one thing more than another? Once you kind of assess that and how they are able to take that information in, you feed that back to them. Some directors are super visual. They want images, they want referential images, they want illustrations, and that's how they understand. Some directors, you can just talk to them and say like, oh, we're going to, you know, I see this and, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever it might be, and they understand that. Or some directors, you want to tell a story to and say, this is the whole back story behind, you know, this set or this idea, and they resonate with that. So I really base how I present on who the director is. Now, when I present to like Marvel and we have our big meetings that encompasses all the producers and their viz dev team, I do a keynote where I put all the images and information and I make that, you know, I pride myself in the fact that I, I'm a pretty good presenter and I like to bring excitement because you want people to be excited about what you're speaking about and what you're showing them. Pretty easy for me to do that. And part of that training came from working at Hasbro Toys for six years and, you know, working in a corporate environment where I'm watching people give pitches all the time and sort of learning in that sort of business sense of what people need to understand emotionally, as well as all the logistics that have to go into something. So I'll present in a big meeting when it's the studio on keynote on a big screen i'll bring um, whatever is necessary whether it's 3d small models of something anything that's tangible that they can put their hands on and really see um i'll bring it in to the meeting if i think that it's going to help them understand where i'm coming from so yeah got it got it and can you talk about designing for a studio versus a location in which you prefer? Building on a stage or in a location. I mean, sometimes you find locations where the design, the production design value isn't something that you can manufacture. So you have to know when that is, you know, it's really comes down to understanding what's necessary. There's often, I mean, as a designer, sure, I want to create and design everything and build it, right? <laughs> Studios don't want me to do that because it's costly. But I also want it to be right. At the end of the day, I feel like it being right supersedes whether it's on a stage or in a practical location. 
Okay, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and what's it? What What's your experience like being Marvel's first female production designer? And props to you, especially in such a male dominated field. I guess sometimes I like to think that I'm a different breed because I just kind of do it. You know, I never really stop to think about the hurdles. I feel them, but I never stop to really think about it long enough for it to uh, inhibit me or place doubt within me. Because if I did that, I would not have finished Black Panther. And I mean, mm -hmm. it was overwhelming um, to understand that. But, you know, when they told me that, I wasn't even aware of that when I got the job that I was the first female. And then when they told me that, I was like, oh, no shit. Oops, excuse me, I don't know if I can cuss. <laughs> Go for it, please curse. Yes, you can. <laughs> I was like, no shit. And they were like, yeah. And I thought, okay, well, you know, that's really cool and everything, but I got this job to do. And that's not something that I really like sat with and took in because I wasn't going to allow it to mess with me in that way. I think probably being the first black designer they had was a little more daunting for me because I felt that I had something to prove in that matter. In that because you know i'm been a lot of the times the first production designer for a lot of things <laughs> black for production designer let alone female so you know where when thomas wasn't and i was i was the first so you get past that after a while as sort of an unfortunate circumstance right because i really shouldn't be the first of any kind right. but i also right. use it as a precedent to change everything so I found that what it did for me in Marvel was make it so I looked at being the first as breaking or taking another brick out of the wall as instead of this thing or being a woman being the first, it's just taking another brick out of the wall so it comes down and taking it out low so the wall comes down faster. And, you know, every time I do something, I'm setting a precedent so the people behind me can point at it and say, it has been done. You cannot keep this from me. It's on record. And that's really where I'm at with all of the things that I'm kind of doing going forward is putting myself in places where they say that a woman or a Black woman, that, that can't be in this industry. And hasn't been, you know, uh, at all. Not at all. I kind of thrive on it a little bit because I like to make people uncomfortable enough, at least, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, be at a place where they cannot question me, say, well, do you really belong here? You can't say that anymore. Yeah. And, and I want to get there for other people. So, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword and it's bittersweet, if you will, to be that. Um, but yeah, no, I didn't really think about it until it was mentioned to me. And then I just was like, well, all right, put that in your back pocket. And what it did was it made them open their eyes to other women. And that's been a good thing. So the precedent was set and now, you know, the next wave comes in and the more that do, the better, the, the more the door is open. I'm good about taking hits and opening doors for the first time. I'm good with that. Whatever's behind it, I can take a punch. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, how do you think the productions that you worked on benefit from your identity? I, well, you know, it's interesting. Ryan Coogler always says that women are the better filmmakers because they're better storytellers, because they are nurturers and emotional by nature in a sense, which is true. But we also have this intuition and empathy that I think not a lot of people have. Um, and that goes across the board. That's not one type of person or another. That's just across the board of humanity. I think for that reason, having to understand the white experience as well as the Black experience makes me more viable on so many different types of projects. I think that a lot of white people don't have to understand the Black experience, but if you're Black and you want to survive, you have to understand the white experience. You have to understand how white people move in this world and how they live because you are being judged based on that 
constantly throughout the day, throughout your life, for every yeah. year that you are in existence. So not only do we have a good grasp, and we're able to relate. Like I didn't watch like Dukes of Hazard and be like, I don't understand this because I'm not white. That there was never a time where I turned on like a white TV show that was predominantly white and not understood it. Like I don't understand this type of living. This is crazy. You know what I mean? Like I had to understand because I could empathize with the emotion in humanity beyond the experience that was happening like when somebody got hurt i understood what that was like when somebody was hurt emotionally i understood what that was like so therefore i understood that experience because i looked at these people with empathy and as humans so in a sense that makes you sort of a little bit more dangerous in the film world of entertainment as a black person because you can understand these experiences and you can then visualize what these are. You have to understand history or you're brought up to understand history. You aren't brought up to understand white history and then you get them up. American history is both black and white <laughs> and native and Asian and everything else. So it's, you know, I think at the end of the day to answer that question, it's like, yeah, it is because I understand all of these things that I can bring that to a production. I can bring a multitude of experiences that I've had to have to a production. So I can do many different types of genres and still get it, you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. It does. <laughs> so earlier you were talking about pitching and making you know the people that you're pitching to feel an emotion. I was really, curious if you can elaborate on that if you have any examples you're you're able to share with us or just talk a little bit more about emotions when pitching to studios and pitching in general well i think the best story i like to tell about that is when i went to basically interview for the production design job for black panther and that was a big pitch and so i did a book of which was what i would say is the first wakandan bible of many different like facets of Wakanda. So I didn't have any information about like a script or any story or I didn't know anything. And it's sort of like a blue sky pitch, which is like, just, you know, imagine as big as you can and just go wherever and it's not restrained, right? That's a blue sky pitch. And um, so I, I just imagined whatever I wanted to. I created a little story about Black Panther that I made a like a real for with illustrator Vicky Poy, who is out of Canada and she's fantastic. And we've been working together ever since. And she did about, you know, 45 boards in two weeks. And then I put these about a 500 page book, actually I'm looking at it right now, put a 500 page book together called um, The Country. And it talked about the people, the landscape, the, um, military equipment, the aircraft, the everything. It was all in one book. I put a book together, builds that I've done. So they needed to understand that I understood green screen. Cause at that point, the biggest mm. movie I worked on was $30 million. And then I put together five, four foot by eight foot boards of illustrations and references about what I thought Wakanda and the city, uh, the golden city, the capital looked like. So I brought all this in and I set it up, right? And I set it up so when you first walk in, the first thing you see are these giant boards with two foot by three foot illustrations on the boards. And and then I had the books laid out and, you know, the Like a Reel was, uh, and that's like a 60 second in animation, was cued and ready to go. And what I wanted them to feel was a cinematic experience. I wanted them to feel majesty and awe when they first laid eyes on the Wakanda that I had envisioned outside of any sort of anything, just this place that I kind of envisioned. And I did that, you know, it did exactly that. And so when, you know, they came in and they saw the boards and that was the first sort of inspirational view of where we were gonna go on this presentation. And I wanted to draw them in. I wanted to suck them in. I wanted them to feel like little kids again when the first time you're sort of, you know, discovering something. And that's very much from my childhood. And so when they sat down at the table, 
I had the lights turned down and I turned on, on the big screen, the like a reel. I put in sound, music, and I just made it very cinematic, turned it up really loud. I wanted them to feel like they were in a theater at that time. And when the lights, when that was over and the lights came down, I passed out the books and we got right into country. And I wanted them to be inside of Wakanda. I wanted them to see that what I thought that it could be as far as, you know, the evolution of Wakanda post-colonialism. I wanted them to feel like the eight, like what has evolved in the, in the future, actually our present, but their, but future necessarily. And they did, you know, and, and they called me the next day and gave me the job. Wow. So it's, you know, you really have to put people in a place and for something like Panther, I wanted them to feel what I wanted audience to feel. And that was just, I wanted them to be blown away. I wanted them to see beauty. I wanted them to see, I wanted them to see the majesty of this place and the majesty of, of the Wakandan people. And I also wanted them to see everything that was taken or could have been taken. Because I was working on Panther during the election, the first election, you know, the designs I did after that <clears throat> day in 2016, they became very aggressive. I look back on that and I can see sort of what mood I was in after, you know, 45 got in office and my designs became very protective and aggressive. And it was me wanting to protect my community and I saw that. So you, yeah, you design and you present on emotion and you show who you truly are and you're 100% transparent and honest about who you are. If they respond to that, then you're gonna get the job. You're gonna get the job. And it's just important to pull people in because if you can't pull people in in a presentation, you can't do it mm -hmm. in an audience or in a theater either. That's amazing. Very much so. <laughs> I've never really been in uh, anywhere near like the studio system, but I always hear these stories about how it's harder to work in a studio system. It's a corporation. What challenges do you face when you're pitching? Are there times where you're thinking like, this is some bullshit and I got to tweak this X, Y, and Z, or could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, different studios are different. So like, you know, when you're talking about Mar Marvel and Disney, those are the big juggernauts, like one of the big six, right? Or big seven now, and or big five, because they've sucked up so many others. You know, everybody says design by committee or, you know, everything's by committee. And honestly, the best experience I had was with Marvel. I felt more free to cre be creative and do what I want to do on Black Panther than I have really on any film, except for working with Soderbergh. He's super cool. And it's like, you know, they really took a step back and let Ryan and I sort of lead that charge. And they brought their expertise when it did come to branding and things like that. Having worked at a toy company, which they work with as well, Hasbro, I kind of understood where I needed to be, but was able to keep things in the place where Ryan and I wanted to be like things that could exist if theoretically and feel grown up and an adult, but you could turn it into a toy. And that's part of that co corporate nature. If you can do that, if you understand how to do those things. And when you look back at your life, every experience you've had is for a reason. The reason I was at Hasbro was exactly mm -hmm. that. I knew how to do that with my eyes closed because I had watched it for six years. You know, I worked on Star Wars. I worked on Phantom Menace at Hasbro and nobody make fun of it. I did it. I already know what it means. Uh, I got my Phantom Menace toys up here and I always shake my head like, you know what? We tried. <laughs> you know what? That was a good effort, but my Amidala doll still looks good, even though she phoned it in. I tell you what, you know, it's, it's just a lot about being able to do all of those things and still be able to survive. You know, it's not as if I didn't have to fight for things that I believed in. And I'll always do that. If I truly, truly, if it's in my gut, like this has to be this, well, you gotta be savvy enough to figure out how to get it. Mm. And if you don't ask, you're definitely not gonna get it. But you know, there's ways. And when I know that I need to concede and it's just not right for the overall story or for another department or for the way the director has envisioned it i need to step back and re-envision it because maybe i'm i am off and something eventually better will come from it mm -hmm. 
And, and that's the other thing you got to keep your eye on. Always know that something better is going to come from it, even though it's hard to kill your babies, if you will. But I never had a problem working in the studio system because I worked in corporate America first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it could be jarring, I could see, for some creatives who've never had the experience to see what that's like. Yeah. Or have had that not had the experience to understand that that is dog eat dog. And the bottom line is going to be the dollar. Mm -hmm. Production design is... 40% creativity and vision, 30% managing personalities, 10% managing a budget, and the rest trying to horse trade. And that's really what it breaks down to for any department head, you know? You've got to juggle a lot at once and you have to be able to pivot really quickly. The thing that people miss i think sometimes is what i do for every film no matter how big or small you have to build a super solid foundation of a look of an idea of a design of something because when things start to change and pivot you can fall back on your foundation and you can make those changes relatively quickly because then you do have a foundation whether that's the color the theme a texture a material that you're using throughout, a shape that you're using throughout that foundation. So when we need to pivot something, I fall back on that. I don't skip a beat and then I keep up because you want to stay ahead of camera and you want to stay ahead of your director. Build a foundation and, and then you'll be okay. But yeah, I've, I've just not had a problem in the studio system. It's, all the studios are different. The bigger they are, the more they want to be involved. And there might be some studios that I don't really want to work with again, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> understandable it happens you know you can't expect that every time you do a job it's going to be a cakewalk there's times where there's inherent problems and even if there are problems it also is like how are the people at the top are they really trying da, 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 da. there's people that i just love to work with that i'll always return to work with can you talk about the trajectory of your career like how did you get into the game and who were the advocates that helped you move from the more junior positions to where you are now? I went to film school and I wanted to be a director, possibly a writer. And I never really thought about production design. And I realized at a certain point in film school, maybe towards the end, because I did a lot of theory work. Um, so you watched a ton of films. And I realized at one point that what I was responding to in all of these films in an emotional way was the art direction. And my professors would always be like, you know, you're really good at art direction. And I just sort of had to start figuring out what that was necessarily. Cause you're not really, at least back then, weren't really taught production design, right? So then a friend of mine <clears throat> had called me and she was like, hey, I'm working on this really small thing. You want to come out in the art department. I need help painting and stuff like that. And I did that. And I was just like, this is awesome. I love this. This is exactly what I want to do because we're telling the story and we get to be creative and it is hard work, but I love hard work. So I want to do that too. And then I pursued it pretty hotly. I graduated from school. I went to New Orleans where I had family. They had just had a tax incentive. So I worked and built my resume in New Orleans. I started out at the bottom. It's not the bottom really, but I started out as a set dresser and I came up the set decoration side. So I was a set dresser, an on-set dresser, a buyer, a set decorator. And then I was a production designer. And I got to a point where I realized I needed to, it was being harder and harder to get design jobs when I started doing that sort of more exclusively. So I started reaching out to talent agents in California and Los Angeles and probably 50 said, you know, no thanks, but no thanks. And one boutique agency um, who I ended up being with for seven years came to New Orleans to meet with me and signed me pretty quickly after that. And pretty quickly after I signed with them, I got the first script they gave me was Fruitvale Station. And then after that, I think the tra my career trajectory took a took a big uh, change. Turn, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it kind of skyrocketed after that. And also Ryan, you know, that was a big deal in my career. And I would say the advocates for me along the way were many, um, from my family just taking me in in New Orleans to 
you know, Dave Blass, who's a production designer on many television shows, who gave me my first set dresser job. Wynn Thomas was a huge mentor of mine. He is Spike Lee's production designer. And he kind of kicked my butt and told me, you know, keep going, don't give up. Cause I was a couple times wanting to give up and he talked me off of the ledge. And, you know, from there, uh, my agent who signed me with Datner Despoto Associates, DDA in Beverly Hills, that was the first agency I was with. I'm with WME now. But Danica Pupa, who was my agent, she was hugely important to my career. She's the one that said, here's for Vail Station, you have to do it. <laughs> I said, let me read the script, you know. Of course I did it because the script was fantastic. Yeah. And at Ryan, it was like a no-brainer. And then, you know, she really went all 100% out there for me and put my name out there as much as possible and fought for me for certain projects really hard. And then when I met Ryan, he just lifted me up and took me with him on his journey and trusted me all the way and just automatically knew I could do it. Even if I didn't, he just, I lived on that confidence that he knew I could do it and I never wanted to let him down. So he was a big voice in my career. And then, you know, it's been people just rallying around the designs that I do and the work that I've done and and so it's a lot of people out there that have been lifting me up and, and helping me along the way, for sure. My son, who he always reminds me, I forgot to thank at the Oscars, so I'd like to thank Dominic <laughs> right now. I love you. Go to bed, like they always say in the Oscars or whatever. He's 20, he's straight 22. He's a full grown ass man. He's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's amazing. Congratulations on all your success, seriously. Thank um, you. Yeah, of course. Now, to segue into that question, how would you tell someone today that wanted to do what you do? How should they get in? You know, it's every way into the industry is like a fingerprint. It's all different. And it depends. For me, it's like, how bad do you want it? You know, do you want it bad enough to go to school? Is that necessary? Where do you live? Right. You have to understand, like, where are you in the world and where are you right now? That's how you tailor how you do anything. I could easily say, well, hey, you know, just start working as a set dresser. Well, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, I'm out of Ohio. I was in Dayton, Ohio. For someone to say to me at that point, hey, you should, you know, be a set dresser. I didn't even really know what that was at the time. And there were no movies in Ohio at the time for me to even try to do that. You know, nothing of consequence that I could probably get on. I didn't know how to do it. If I hadn't have gone to a tax incentive state where movies were constant, I don't know how fast or slow it would have taken me, but you have to be savvy and decide, do you want to move someplace to get in the business like Atlanta or New Orleans, which is picking up? And then you got to hit that pavement because that's what I did. I took my little portfolio, my little two page portfolio with my you know, one of the pages was a resume and the other page had a bunch of pictures of like stuff I did, sets I did on short films and things. You know, I went from person to person and they'd be like, hey, you need to go over to this person. And I would go to that person and show them my little thing. And they'd say, okay, this is, you know, you got something on here and hey, go over to this person because they're not union. They're working on a non-union film. And they'll hire you. That was Dave Boss hired me. He was like, okay, yeah, come on that. And what it did for me while that film was this horrible children's movie that didn't ever happen. I don't even know if it was ever finished. You know, I don't know what happened to that movie, but it was on my resume and no one else knew what happened to it either. But it looked like, you know, I did a movie, I did a feature as a set dresser. So that helped me get my next job. You just have to find your way into that one spot on that one job that you can put on your resume that somebody will say like, okay, they have experience that did that one job and now I need them on this. I mean, I started on low, I did low budget horror movies as a designer, 500,000, $900,000, $1 million, 18 day shoot, three week prep feature horror movie for, um, I forget the name of the company that was putting out these like, you know, on DVD and stuff like that. You know, some of it was gore and stuff like that. But what it did was it taught me a lot of stuff. It taught me how to work a budget, really work a budget because you had like five pennies to rub together. And it showed me how, like my first time I built a set was on one of those movies. And I talked my way into that. I was like, we should build, you know, I had no idea how that worked, but I was like, yeah, we should do that. Since I wanted to learn. 
And the producers were like, sure, we can do that. And you got this much money. And it's like, okay, we'll do what we can with that, you know? And so I had to figure it out. So I just got in where I could get in and took every job, even though it seemed like it was sucked. Um, there was something about it that I needed to learn. And I was basically giving myself a master class in production design or my own schooling in production design by getting these jobs. So they were actually paying me as little as it was, I was getting paid to go to school. Love it. If you had to estimate what percentage of a production budget do you think goes to your department? Well, it's Generally. supposed to be 10%. <laughs> okay. It was always supposed to be 10%, right? Um, that's how it started uh, way back. You know, the first production designer was on Gone with the Wind. And that was the first time the title was given. Otherwise, it was art directors that you'll see on old movies in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Gone with the Wind was the first production designer. And, you know, from that point forward, it was always like 10% of the overall budget. This is back when 50 million was a big budget. Now you get to 200. $250 million movies, they want to give you 5%. I still go for 10. And you usually end up spending 10% anyways of the budget. So pretty much whatever it is, 10%. What tips can you offer people who are working on their portfolio? You know, they, maybe they've worked on a few projects. They're looking to, maybe they've worked on a few short films and they're looking to branch out and do feature films and get to that next level. What tips can you offer for working on their portfolio? So I think one of the big things that I think is appropriate is to tailor your portfolio in a couple different ways because certain projects want to see certain things from you and you have to know your audience, if you will. So you'll probably not just do one portfolio. Like if you're sending out to agencies, let's say, it's going to be one thing, right? You're going to show all your work and everything you've done and your resume and all that stuff. Let's say you're going out to horror film like Get Out. Let's just take that for instance. What do you think that they're going to want to see? You're going to have a little bit of an idea about it. It's a horror movie. It's this director. It's this studio, What whatever it might be. You're going to tailor your portfolio because you want them to see the things that are going to be of importance to their movie. You want to specify in that way. Have you done anything? with effects in a short? Have you done anything with blood in a short? Have you done anything that's sort of darker, that's in that genre? You wanna show them that part of your portfolio that you think has to do with the job that you're getting. There's no point to show them like, I've done uh, something that could be like a rom-com to a horror, right? You wanna show some more, some drama, some, something moody, if you feel like that's what they're looking for. That's what I would say about that. Otherwise, you know, you want to put the best of your work into your portfolio. You want to put art department and production design. You want to put a varied amount, like here I've been able to build something. I've painted this. We've augmented this. Before and afters are always good to see like there was absolutely nothing in the space. And then we did this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So people can see like, wow, you know what I mean? You did this. And this was your budget. Now, you don't ever want to put budgets in your portfolio, but they'll ask you about it. And you can always say it like this budget was, you know, $10,000. And look at these sets that we did. They're amazing. And that means that you know how to work with money and make it stretch and still get what you want, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the thing. So on lower budget movies, you want to show that off a little bit. That's what I would say about portfolios. I don't generally look at them. I'll call references. I'll look to see how much you have done, who you've worked with, because I probably know somebody that you've worked with. Unless it's someone who's kind of right on that line of you're just about ready to, you've got a few features under your belt and you're just about ready to go on to something big. You've done different, you know, budget point films in different markets. Especially if I don't know your references, I want to look at your portfolio just to see that I know that you know certain software. Definitely if you've worked in certain software, even if you didn't do something on a film, but you did certain something on your own, Moto, Maya, SketchUp, you know, whatever, put examples of that in there or make examples to put it so you can see like, oh, I understand how this works. I'm sorry. These are software programs? Uh-huh. Modo, M-O-D-O. And what are they used for? 3D. Gotcha. 
a lot of people work in that. And that's the other thing. Like, if you're going to get into a craft that's technological, even directing nowadays, you got to know what's going on with the software. And that's not always an easy thing to do. If you're interested in production design, then you should look into the Art Directors Guild because that's what every production is. That's our union. Mm -hmm. That's uh, 800 in Los Angeles. And they often have initiatives for young people who are interested in art department where they will either find you a mentor or pair you with somebody, or they have events that you can come out and meet other professionals and talk to them. They have panels all the time. I do panels for the Art Directors Guild all the time at Comic-Con. And I did a talk in, at the Egyptian Theater in LA where I got to meet a lot of young people you know, search out people. I did a talk in um, Chicago at the International Film Festival. They had uh, Adam Stockhausen there. They had Lynn Thomas there. I met so many young people who were interested in design and art department. You know, you, you really have to do those types of things, you know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So what kind of details do you look for in somebody's portfolio or somebody's, you know, real examples that showcase good art? art and production design a lot of the times you know if it's an art director or if it's a set decorator especially if it's a set decorator i look to see how seamless it is between like do, am i really something really sticking out in a strange way is something not seeming right with the um story is you know what i mean like because sometimes the production design or set decoration you don't really want people to notice it in some circumstances some circumstances obviously you do like pv's big house you want to notice all of that stuff but in something like us you don't well yeah you want to notice some of it in us that's not a good example dark waters um, dark waters you don't really want to notice it you know what i mean it's really not about that but it's there and we did a ton <laughs> we built barns and farmhouses mm -hmm. so it's like but you don't want to know that that's what that is so i'll look for that i will look for you know technical abilities if i'm hiring a set designer or like how much drafting can they do what software do they know things like that it's really tailored to what position anybody is really singularly trying to come into. You've mentioned that you reached out to an agency and, and you got signed. Are they fairly accessible? Is that a, a commonplace thing where people are reaching out to them cold and kind of launching their careers or? I think maybe some of my naivete helped with that. Cause I didn't know. I was like, this is exactly what I did. I went online. I looked up all my favorite designers, right? Jess Gonshore. Dennis Gassner, Adam Stockhausen, Wynn Thomas, you know, at least the, those are some of the American ones. And I saw, went to see who represented them. So I wrote all of their agents down as if, right? And I was like, here, let me put down Gersh. And I, I, then I went online and I started looking up talent agencies and then I would see who was on their roster, what kind of movies they were giving to those people on their roster. And then I would send them an email and I would say, you know, hi, my name is Hannah Beekler. I am looking for, I'm currently looking for representation. This is exactly my email. Please find attached my resume and my portfolio. Feel free to contact me about my email, my phone number, whatever ways to contact me and send. And I did that to like every agency. And of course I went to every big agency. I was like, oh, UTA and you know what I mean? There's five big agencies, CAA, UTA, ICM, WME, um, the other one. I'm sure I can't remember what it is. Gersh is a big one. Merck is a big one. Um, but, and they all said no. And they are all like, we are not, we, we are not representing any new people currently. Thank you. We'll keep this on file. And then if they didn't have an email, because sometimes if you look up the agencies, they don't even have like an email mm -hmm. that you can send to, I would just call. <laughs> and I would be like, hi, I'm looking for representation. Do you have an email or somebody I can send my information to? And usually you're talking to like a receptionist, so they'll give you the information of one of the agents. And I just kept doing it until finally DDA was the last one that I sent it to. And it is a little daunting to have so many say no. And basically I was at the point as a production designer where producers weren't 
looking for designers from New Orleans, right? They weren't, they were getting their designers out of LA. And I had just joined the Art Directors Guild, yes, when I had my agent. My name wasn't anywhere. I wasn't, producers weren't looking at me. I didn't know how to get work on my own because the business will always be in Los Angeles. They can make movies wherever they want to make movies, but the deals are made in Los Angeles. And I had no reach there. I was in New Orleans. I couldn't afford to move to Los Angeles to sort of put myself out there. I needed someone to represent me in places I couldn't be or had no access to. That's why I needed to get an agent to, to take the next step. And Statner took that, you know, they looked at everything. I mean, shit, I didn't think they would. I, I don't know what they saw. Cause they were like, well, we think you have potential. And I was like, God damn, all right, let's do this. And I was with them for seven years and we were, we sat down and we talked about what I saw my career to be, what I wanted my career to be. And I told them the things that I felt like I really wanted was to find a director that I could have a career with and grow with and work with until I retire in this business. And that's Ryan. And so they pretty much did everything I wanted. I think what happened with Datner is I grew out of Datner. And then I needed an agency with an even bigger reach, which was uh, WME. Yeah. And, you know, it's always a business. They were my friends, but you got to remember it's a business too. And that's what agencies are for. It's to, to sort of help uh, mold your career, take you where you want to go. I want to direct. I want to produce. I want to have my own development company. <clears throat> At the end of the day, when I retire, I want to retire sitting in the CEO seat of a development company. So, you know, those are my other goals. I still want to do more with production mm -hmm. design. I don't think winning an Oscar is the end all be all as far as like I've done it all. I have not. There's still so many people I want to work with that I consider uh, masters in this industry. And I would like to work with them and have that experience. So, you know, agents are in the beginning, I think very important. There are people without agents, you know, you don't have to have one. I needed it because of what my location and I was in New Orleans and I wasn't going to leave. So, and I haven't, and, the, and, it, and it worked to my advantage. It did. That's awesome. Can you offer any tips for newer directors when it comes to working with production designers? Ryan was a first time director when I, when I worked with him. And I think sometimes first time directors, they have a vision. They're very specific about what they want, because I feel like oftentimes first time directors are mimicking rather than creating, which is fine. You have to mimic in order to figure out who you are as a person. But I think at the same time, they have to understand that your costume designer, your prop master, your production designer, your DP are all there in service of your vision, but are also artists, are also designers, are also storytellers. And if they have more experience than you, you need to hear what they have to say because they might say something that you hadn't thought about. Um, that could be a chain, you know, deal breaker. And, and it's all about uh, collaboration, um, not mm -hmm. dictatorships, you know? Uh, of course, at the end of the day, the director's vision is what we are all working towards because we believe in that vision, but you know, you also have to understand that as a director, that certain things work a certain way, like money is finite sometimes that, you know, your production designer is there to try to get you as much as possible, but you will be stopped by your budget at some point, and then you have to prioritize. So it's just work with them on the vision and the collaboration and, and take moments to, to listen and look, when I started working with Ryan, first time director, he had only done shorts before and he just graduated USC. He was 25. And he, there wasn't a moment, not one moment where we weren't collaborating together. He had a vision for Fruitvale Station, a very clear and specific vision. And part of it was he was a Bay kid and he knew what that looked like at the time of Oscar Grant. So I needed to listen to that because I'm not from that place. And Ryan taught me how important place is. That's what I learned from him. For me, 
He learned how important budget is and time is and schedule is and creative is. And that we can turn one thing into a million things. You can get your locations and your schedule. That's part of my job. Like I, I was there on that to make it easy for him to, to get everything we needed and still keep it within the Bay Area, right? Um, feel of 2009 and pay homage to that and honor that city. That's how you work with your department heads is you hear them. I remember when he was working with the prop people on Fruitvale Station and they were um, very experienced, very good prop people. They were bringing things to him and they're like, oh, you know, when he goes to the grocery store to pick up these crab legs for these king crab legs for his grandma, we can, you know, put it in the different ways where he could carry it and the different reasons why he would be carrying it that way. And I can remember sitting there, Ryan going like, I never even thought about him carrying, having to take these and carry them out of the store. Like, you know, as a director, he didn't think about that. He was just writing the scene, but never really finish the scene as like, oh, well, we could see him leaving and this is how this is gonna happen and the reasons why it was happening because at this specific place where the real Oscar worked, this is what it looked like when they gave you crab legs, right? But he never even thought about that. And that's why we're here. So you don't have to. So, you know, you gotta hear us when we're, when we're talking and that's the best way, just be open, you know? Don't just say it has to be like this. And some directors do that. Tim Burton is well known for that. He's well known for here's my book of everything and handing it over to his department head because he was an illustrator and obviously he can draw. So he would draw everything. And Aggie Rogers, who was the costume designer on Fruitvale Station, who did Beetlejuice, she was the costume designer on Beetlejuice and on Pee Wee's Big Top with Tim Burton. She said that he handed her a book on Beetlejuice of all of the costumes that he had designed and I said to her, I said, well, what was that like? Like, I would have kind of maybe been upset, right? Because how dare you? But she said, you know what? That didn't make me any less the costume designer. I still brought something to the table. And I said, but how? And she said, you know that one of the costumes was the wedding dress that Winona Ryder wears. And it was white when he drew it. And I just dyed it red because I thought that's what would be right. And when he saw it, he said, absolutely. That's what it should be. Now, had she just done what he said, you wouldn't have gotten that great look and that great scene. And he loved it at the end of the day. That was more right than what he did. So you just have to be brave enough to bring that to someone who is also sensible enough and brave enough to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Can you talk about how much you're involved with Easter egg references and foreshadowing within like set decor? And if this is something you notice when watching other films? Oh, absolutely. I love Easter eggs and I like to plant them all over the place constantly all the time. And I have done it from the very jump of my career. <laughs> it's such a fun, like, I don't know, maybe it's again, me just fucking with people. But can you, for people who don't know that might be listening, can you explain what an Easter egg is? Like on Creed, we put Easter eggs all over the place from all the different Rockies. And um, uh, it kind of tells you something about either something you're paying homage to or that connects loosely to something else that foreshadowing something that might happen in another movie or in that movie, something that tells you about the character from another movie. Like if, you know, we were doing Black Panther and I put something on the set that talked about Tony Stark's connection to um, T'Chaka, you know, uh, Black Panther's father, which there is a connection between Tony Stark's father and Black Panther's father. And there were Easter eggs about that, but I can't say what they were. <laughs> and, um, you know, we put Easter eggs, like I said, we put a lot of Easter eggs in Creed that had to do with the first film that we would put down, like his belt that he won, um, the towel that he threw in when Apollo Creed died because we were working, it was Creed, right? And so there were things like that. So that's kind of what it, that's what an Easter egg is. And we pop them in and I don't ever tell anybody about them. I put them, like I said, in everything, even lemonade. I can't say what any of that is. And the uh, most current Black Parade, there's, I did one video on Black Parade and I did some interstitials, but I did still have the ability to put Easter eggs in. <laughs> yeah. Great segue. 
because I was going to ask you, <laughs> Reggie already knows, what it was like to work with Beyonce. You know, I mean, her image is one of an artist that is like heavily involved in all aspects of her artistic expression. So I wanted to know how you collaborated with somebody like that, especially in the area of music more so than like film or TV. I mean, I really adore working with her and it's the third time that I've worked with her. Um, so she keeps calling me, so it must not be so horrible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, here's the thing about working with her, let's say like on Lemonade, there's a lot of security. So I didn't actually hear all of the music and I only heard uh, one song on, two songs on Lemonade. And a lot of it was just her explaining like what the purpose was, what the point was, what she was doing with the feelings that she wanted. Cause it was such a deconstruction of emotions and things that she was going through that it transcended pretty much everything. And it was such a free form type of way of doing, it was a completely different than any way I've ever worked before because she does have choreography and the music. And, and so, you know, there's, there's a ton of people everywhere and there's a lot of secrecy, you know, and, and I, and I appreciate, and I understand that and what that allowed me to do was through our conversations, kind of just do what I felt and not be beholden to the sound of the music, which is an interesting way to work, honestly, because I would think that I, I and I said a couple of times, like, I really want to hear what it is, like all of the album. Um, but you know, that's how that went. And, um, you know, I mean, what are you going to say? Well, we right. were in Jamaica. You just hope that what you thought of, I'm sure coincided with the, the song that you That's made. exactly right. But she's yeah. always going to do, here's what she's going to do. She's going to have a bunch of different moments that she's filming. And really it's about how she's putting it together that works. It's the moments that she's talking about that some are pretty wild that I was like, huh, you want what? Okay, like, I don't get it, but sure. And she's got it all up in her head. And because of the way it's such a deconstruction and that she works, it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's able to be edited into the story because she already knows the pieces. Jamaica, that was probably the most fun. I mean, it was the most hard, but it was the most fun as well. Um, that I did hear because it was for their uh, uh, On the Run 2 tour, Interstitial. So I did hear all the music for that um, because it was really based on our set list, which was music, you know, wasn't a, a ton of new music either. That was, I mean, when, the way we worked on that, because she was also working on the tour and doing um, Ape Shit, like she did Ape Shit right after that. And then I went right back to LA to finish up um, working on on the interstitials in LA and then doing a few things for Coachella because she was just getting ready to do that. I mean, like she doesn't, you know what I mean? Like you work with her the best you can, but she's doing 800 things at once. And when we did Black Parade, you know, she wasn't even supposed to be there for the two days, but she came because she was directing. So that was nice. And yeah, I mean, it's chaos. <laughs> it's total chaos. That's how she works. <laughs> and you kind of just do whatever. But I'm telling you right now, the level of the energy on the set, because that's really my main focus is cinema, is the set, is the visual, more so than even the music, obviously, because she doesn't always play that. And um, But I already knew all the, mu the music on the gifts, pretty much. So it was a kind of easier that way. Lemonade had not been released, but that was way under security. You know, it is, it is a, it's a lot of chaos, but this, the best way to work with the, that she works. I mean, I don't even know what to say, but she kind of lets me just do whatever. She'll give me references, like what she wants to reference, which I can't really say. And then it's, um, I interpret that into what it becomes. You'll see on uh, <laughs> my power is the video that I did. And yeah, somebody already called out the reference just on like the one second it was showed in that clip. And I was like, damn, you got that from that? But that's great because it's like the way that you do an interpretation. And a lot of what she does is interpretation, but she also gives artists, she lets artists be artists, man. She doesn't like micromanage you or lord over you. I mean, when it comes to her costumes and stuff, I'm, I, I, you know, 
I imagine that's probably a lot more work with Marnie and um, <laughs> that's a lot, you know, the, the, her costume area was like, I've never seen anything except for Ruth Carter on Panther, but it was huge. Like you walked into this like airplane hangar type looking thing and it was just filled with clothes. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> Wow. I've never, and I just oh started shopping. And I love all of her, um, you know, stylists and costume people. But yeah, I mean, working with Beyonce is, you're working with greatness. She's 10 feet away from you performing and you have full, unadulterated understanding of why she is who she is and why she is where she is. She does not stop working. She is constantly creating. To see her perform like like that close to you, it's, I can't put that into words. Like the whole place is electrified when we were doing that. Like, I can't even put it, like you can't put it into words. So of course, whenever she calls, I'm gonna work with her. It doesn't matter how much chaos or what I hear or don't hear or what anything is, you just wanna be there for it because it's the one time where blackness is celebrated in a way that you feel more whole than you've ever felt. <laughs> That's dope. Yeah, very, very. Hannah, this was so awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for offering your expertise, your knowledge, your professional history, and just so much insight on how to get into this sector of the business. Yeah. Um, before we wrap, I just wanted to know, or the listeners also want to know, how they can get in touch with you or stay, you know, stay abreast of what you're working on. At Chinchilla1970 on Twitter. I believe that's my Twitter handle. And you can, I'm, I've been very vocal on Twitter lately too. And like every day I'm like, that's it. I'm not getting on Twitter anymore. And then sure enough, I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> like every morning from like 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. I like angry tweet, then go back to sleep and wake up to like a shit storm. Like, oh my God, what did I say? It was too early in the morning to be tweeting. But I also, <clears throat> like events and things that I do, I tweet about that and any organizations and things. I like to uplift young voices who want to be in the biz, who want to tweet at me. I'll uh, retweet it. Just usually people have been tweeting me like their portfolio or tweeting me a link to their website if they have one. And I retweet that because I have a lot of people in the industry that follow me as well and that I follow too a lot of production designers. So I do that whenever somebody tweets at me is, you know, boost, boost people's signals. That's one way to kind of, you always know what's going on in my life on Twitter because I've got a big mouth. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. You got something That's to say. Right. That's right. I got a lot to say. So but thank you for having me so much. I appreciate this. It's been lovely awesome. speaking with both of you. Likewise. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space podcast. This episode was co-executive produced by Gabrielle Charles and Sino Gibson and was edited by Courtney Lett. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. All right, see you soon.